So I'm saying that this is not a lecture. It's designed to be a brief overview of the law, which I know that everybody in the room will be very familiar with, and to look at threshold from a drafting perspective and trying to um, point out some common pitfalls and some ways to avoid um, those when drafting threshold. There is a bit of law at the beginning, though, but I'm not going to read it off the slides. You've got copies of the slides and they've been emailed around to those of you joining remotely. So we all are familiar with um, Section 31 and what threshold is and the elements of threshold. Um, the first point really to unpick from that is the, the significant harm point and then what that is attributable to. So in terms of harm, I've set out um, what the definition of harm is when the Act itself in the slides for you to review it in your own time, really. I don't propose to, to read out the slides, as I've said. And it's really a, a common definition, quite easy to understand what harm is. And in terms of it being significant, we know that significant means considerable, noteworthy or important on the those cases based on the slide. And in terms of it being significant, we know that it must be significant enough to justify the intervention of the state. And um, we all know that um, treating out proceedings and care proceedings are particularly serious proceedings. And I think when drafting threshold, it's really important to bear in mind whether it's significant enough to justify. I think it's easy to get caught up in harm being significant on the papers, especially when we're looking at very young children or home conditions that perhaps are, are inadequate over a period of time. It's really to drill down into the information we've got and whether that is significant enough to justify intervention and whether there's other factors that come into play that make it cross that line. And RIA, we're all very familiar with RIA and, and the guidance that it provides it, it is well, well set with law. I've unpicked a couple of the key paragraphs here, in my view from RIA, uh, and my view of, of RIA is that when you drill down into the, the information that's available there and the judgment itself, it does kind of provide somewhat of a checklist in terms of drafting, and I've unpicked um, further in, in the slides what, what those key factors are, but in terms of, we all know, it's the local authority that must prove its case, and in order to prove its case, you must have the evidence to do so. Again, a rather dense slide because I've unpicked it so that you can really read it more in your own time. Uh, again, this highlights uh, about proving threshold and that where there's a factual challenge on some points, it's the local authority that must deduce the evidence to prove um, the fact that it seeks to, and that where the thing is um, challenged um, or put in issue then it's for the local authority to prove the thing and establish the significance attributed it, to it by the local authority. So it's not just that an incident happened, it's to connect that then to the harm that's alleged and also that that harm is significant to the child. I found um, paragraph 10 particularly helpful because I, I, I noted that the language is really quite stark in terms of what's adjusted Monday was trying to untick here, and where there's a factual allegation and there's evidence to support it, the language used in drafting threshold, it shouldn't be it's alleged or it's stated or it's reported, the allegation should be clear and stark language should be used, such as if there's evidence to support it, as the examples given in paragraph 10, he lied or he did X or Y. And linking, again, I've referred to it already and that paragraph 12 really unpicks it. And I think if, if when the put a draft threshold, we really break it down um, to the facts A, B and C, justify the conclusion that the child has suffered or is at risk of suffering significant harm and then specify the type of harm X, Y and Z. Um, I've come across it a number of times when looking at thresholds. Um, they don't always specify the type of harm. I think when it's a physical injury, the type of harm is glaringly obvious to everybody. But when we're looking at more emotional harm or psychological harm, it's it's important to really unpick that and spell that harm out so that it's clear. 
um, common pitfalls that are either identified um, there, lack of clarity in the allegation itself or linking this to the harm, and then to specify the, the type of harm. Um, I was trying to work out when I was preparing these slides, well, how, how do we avoid this, particularly with the, the type of harm, because it's not always obvious, really, to, to specify, well, is it emotional harm? Is it psychological harm? Is it both? Um, so what I thought might be helpful for people to consider when they're trying to identify the type of harm is whether there's anything that we can glean from the presentation of the child or whether the child actually exhibits any effect of the harm suffered and whether that can feed into this really careful considered drafting of threshold and specific allegation, specific type of harm to tie it together. Um, primary um, evidence, um, I've seen on a number of thresholds that there's an over-reliance on multiple hearsay and various reports or records which have been contributed <laughs> to by <laughs> members of local authority or school records, for example, and also the chronology. <laughs> We all know the importance of getting the primary evidence and getting that primary evidence um, early. Um, I had a case recently where there was a report made by the school, and I think the original report was made to the out of hours um, emergency social work. It was sent through late, and then it went through various social work to adding bits and pieces to it. And then the only reference to that incident, which was quite significant, was in the chronology. And the local authority didn't actually have the foresight to um, get a statement from the teacher that took the original account from, from the child until that very, very late stage. And um, we all know that threshold can be amended during the course of proceedings. So even if at an interim stage, you can only rely on the chronology, for example, or a, a second or third hand report. It's important to be live at an early stage, in my view, to know what evidence you need to get the primary evidence and the best evidence you can to support your, your threshold allegations. And again, references to the evidence. Um, I often find that when I see a reference to a chronology, it's, it's not actually the case that local authority don't have a, a better reference to that from a social worker, for example, but it, it is unfortunately the case that the only reference is to the chronology um, from the, the point of view of representing uh, a parent, so I also do a lot of um, parent work, um, it's actually easier to take a parent through a threshold and actually drill down into the issues if the references are in the threshold at an early stage, because then you can simply take the parent to, to the reference itself, to that piece of primary evidence that local authorities have. Uh, and that, it, in my view, is, makes it easier to broker an agreement towards threshold moving forward and to narrow the issues quite considerably and it's properly referenced. <clears throat> I've tried to um, create a little bit of a, a checklist to help when, when drafting um, threshold. I've done a list of points there. Is your threshold succinct with clear and direct allegations? Clear and respective whether what is alleged has caused harm or significant harm? And specific about what the harm the child has suffered or is likely to suffer, as well as establishing the causal link between the stated fact and the alleged harm. And again, that it's properly evidence with direct evidence and first hand evidence if possible to be used rather than relying on, on hearsay evidence. And the final point is that being accessible to the person who needs to respond. And whilst we know that threshold has a very important legal purposes and we've gone through the, the compliance with re -A, and it must be specific. I think there's a lot to be said for um, the words in the threshold to be succinct and to be clear, but also to bear in mind, particularly if it's a case where the parents have learning disabilities, for example, or the parents are particularly vulnerable to consider whether they're actually going to be able to understand the document, because it's always better for the, the local authorities if it's all possible for threshold to be agreed, or at least the factual disputes with threshold to be narrowed so far as is possible. And if it's a case where there's multiple dates listed and multiple incidents, and the parents say, oh, I can't recollect or has their difficulties that makes it difficult for them to follow what's being alleged, is it really necessary for the threshold to be so verbose, or can it be cut down, can it be more succinct? Um, 
when I read thresholds, I often find the ones that stand out the most are actually the shorter ones rather than the lengthy ones. And that's not to say that necessarily the lengthy ones have inappropriate points in or things that aren't really compliant. It's just the nature of the document. And if it's stark and succinct, it, it comes across as more powerful to me. And also, it's more likely to perhaps be agreed um, by parents or the issues narrowed in terms of the, the factual issues. <laughs> Um, I've highlighted a couple of bits. The top one actually, Andrew, drew to my um, attention <laughs> in an email when I um, first offered to give this talk a number of months ago now. It's the London Borough of Newham, the mothers um, from this year. And it was her honour Judge Reardon. And it, the, the case was listed on an urgent basis for an interim um, care order hearing. And there have been previous proceedings. and. Luckily, really, Her Honour Judge Regan had heard the previous set of proceedings because without that, um, the presentation of the case and the issues in the social work statement was starkly different to the findings that the court had actually made. And I think what had happened is that the London Borough had changed. So whilst the social worker from Newham had got the social work records, that hadn't been provided with a copy of the judge's judgments. The social worker prepared their initial evidence based on the social services records and the allegations that they were making, and um, rather than the judgment itself. So that's just a, a reminder there in, in very clear terms at paragraph 33 from that judgment that the judgment handed down by the court in a previous hearing is going to be the starting point for any future. <laughs> so it's important that we've got the full picture there in terms of the issues. Louisa did also sort of the court appeal said in any case where there are all that there should be a judgment for them. Absolutely. I think you're right, Andrew. Yes, and I've certainly noted in the more recent commitments that I've done that transcripts are for automatically, which I think will hopefully avoid. This, this happening uh, again, and unusually, Ron and Judge Reardon took the view to um, <laughs> all of the um, advocates in that case because she took the view that they weren't really to blame for that issue because they hadn't been involved in the family before, they were all instructed at the last minute. But I think it's just important for the, the local authority to be mindful of that. And the final case there is um, West Sussex County Council and K. It's actually <laughs> that I, I joined at the very end with um, Maria. <laughs> sorry, so it's all right, Tam. Do you want me to pause? No, it's all okay. Yeah, I'll just need to just... And um, the, this case was where the, the mother suffered very sadly a catastrophic brain hemorrhage, and that left her incapacitated incapacitated and unable to exercise her parental responsibility and she required the assistance of the official solicitor and um, all advocates in the case made reference to um, Reed J and how past harm will inform the parents of um, future harm um, but his son just thought didn't accept that and he, he found that actually he could find the threshold was met and very importantly I know Marie is shaking her head it, the legal view that he took or his interpretation of the authorities was entirely different to all of the advocates on the case. And, and I was the child, and it was for the, the best way in the world. We all wanted this care order to be made, which was possible, but we didn't find um, have a good reading with the authorities. It was actually a legally correct um, position. Andrew agrees with Yes. Okay. I had a, a long, long track of the West Sussex rap. Well, yeah. I just don't think the pressure was made. No, I, I think the original DNA was really wrong well to fudge it and you know, yes. just made an interim care order without addressing it. And that judgment is it, it, um, quite an interesting read, particularly in my view, with the, the paragraphs of Reed J that his own judge thought picked out to try and 
support his view. And um, so there's a summary on, on the Westgate website as well, the, the judgment itself. It's not an overly lengthy judgment, but if you haven't read it, I would say that that's probably um, worth a read in, in terms of what the correct um, position of going forward is on the threshold. Um, so that's really all I wanted to, to cover in, in, in a nutshell. I would say it was a rather rapid refresher on the phrase, but I know we can start um, slightly late. So I didn't know if there's any, any questions or any points or discussion that arise from that.